That's so beautiful. Thank you. And a lovely applause because sometimes when I get introduced, they go, and why are you wearing that shirt? I uh, wonder where she's from, probably the Gold Coast. <laughs> What's she going to tell us wearing a shirt like that? People whisper about it. I see them whispering. Look, mm-hmm-hmm. I know. So let me tell you how I've become to wearing this shirt. I grew up in regional Queensland. I lived in a country town. We went out hard and fast back then, didn't we? You just left school and got a job. 16, get out, get a job. None of this sitting around having a gap year wondering what you might do with yourself and trying to find yourself. You just got out and got a job. So, country Queensland, pubs and hairdressers, two choices. <laughs> so I thought, I know what I'll do, I'll be a hairdresser. So you might be thinking, because I wanted to be a hairdresser, maybe it was because I'm a really good talker. You've already noticed I'm a really good talker. Maybe it was just because I talk a lot and hairdressers have got to be really good communicators, so I'd be really good. Yeah, that wasn't my reason. Maybe you're thinking, oh, well, I just thought, well, maybe it could just because I love to practice on dad and practice on my brother. I just love to cut hair. That wasn't my reason. Well, I love to be creative. I'd be very good hairdresser. I love to create. Yeah, that wasn't my reason either, clearly. I just wanted to be a hairdresser because I wanted to be cool. I mean, hairdressers are cool. You always know when a hairdresser has entered the room. They got the right de- gear on, they got the right do, I bet they got the right moves on the dance floor. Cool. You see, it was already happening to me then, at the age of 16, where I thought that I wasn't good enough and I wanted to fit into the cool crowd and have what it looks like out there to be a part of the cool crowd and be successful. I had a great career in hairdressing. I know you're going to be shocked, but guess what? I never made cool. (laughs) And I'm okay about it now. Because what I discovered was in the pursuit of cool, we lose who we are, which is our uniqueness. And that happens on the inside. So I wear my sequins now and I can feel the judgments. But I'm okay with that because when we are living and being true to who we are, you will get judged. But you have to live your truth because at the end of the life, that's what will matter, not what everybody else thought of you. And what happens when we design a life around the outside stuff, which is how we're coerced into thinking whether we like it or not, through media, through marketing. We're not good enough unless you drive that car, live in that suburb, in that street, with this sort of house, then I've made it. You already made it just because you arrived. You look at a newborn baby and we are in awe, are we not? We see a miracle of life. You look at those fingers and toes like you've never seen fingers and toes before. And you were amazed. People looked at you like that. People still look at you like that. You just grew up is all. You never look at a newborn baby and go, well, look at you, you're a mess. (laughs) Life's going to be tough with that nose, I'm telling you. (laughs) And I tell you what, you'll look a little bit better when you get some designer gear on you. No, we see a miracle. And that's what we've got to go back to, because what happens when we have created a life so good on the outside? What happens when it all falls apart? Because one day it will, because change is inevitable. We were never promised a life with no natural disasters. We were never promised a life without a global financial crisis or a business going down or losing a job or losing somebody. And if we are so obsessed with keeping it all looking good on the outside, what happens when we lose that job and we've placed our worth in that and over-identified in that? What happens when that marriage breaks down that we don't want to admit it to everybody else because we feel like we've failed when we've over-identified in that? And sometimes it will all fall apart. And I know this for sure because for you heard that I've been doing this for 17 years. And so there I was for eight of those years talking about positive thinking and motivational. And, and it's easy to talk about all that when life's going well and things are good. How's things? Great. We've got our spiel worked out. Everything's perfect. And it was beautiful husband, two beautiful boys who were eight and four at the time, doing what I absolutely love to do and getting paid for it. Life was great. Easy to be motivated. And then my husband and I went to bed. You're wondering where this is going now, aren't you? (laughs) It's okay, come along. It was on the 16th of December 2004. We went to bed, rolled, said goodnight, rolled over. We woke up in the morning and it was one of those moments. One of those moments that you've heard about from other people today. One of those moments that you may have had where your life has changed forever and you just want to rewind it. My husband could not walk, he could not talk, he could not move his right arm and the right side of his face was paralysed. He'd had a massive stroke during the night, he was 41 years old. You don't get up this morning and go, I feel great, isn't this fantastic? Because it's not great and you don't feel great. You can't go from this devastation straight to joy. 
that we've been taught by this positive thinking philosophy that we've got to be great. Well, sometimes it's not, and it's okay that it's not. So we were at devastation. And I know that you have noticed when you're at devastation, things get worse before they can get better. And we say, why doesn't life give them the break? It happens individually, it happens in families, it happens in communities, and it happens globally in a financial crisis. Things get worse before they get better. And that's what happened to me, that's for sure. Every bit of bad luck that was going through my neighbourhood come and knocked on my door and I opened it up and said, come on in, this is where it's happening. So my husband's in hospital having a stroke. I don't know about a stroke, what does a stroke mean? When's he coming home? What's he gonna, when's he going to be like my husband again? I just want my husband back and my nice life that I had. Thanks very much, it was all looking really good. So, and then my son splits his head open. He's in the hospital getting stitched up. And then the next day, my other son gets a vomiting wog. I'm in overnight hospital with him. My husband's still in another hospital. I don't know what happened to my other son that night. My life was a mess. Somehow we get to Christmas Eve. So we get to 16th of December to Christmas Eve. Try, wrapping up presents. I mean, the kids still want to do Christmas. My husband's not coming home. I've got to do Christmas for the boys. Wrapping up presents. Now, evidently, the dog over the back heard what was going on too. I sucked him into the vortex and he started barking. Now I'm trying to get some sleep to ward off this nervous breakdown I think might be coming on. And the dog's barking and barking and barking. Oh, you never heard it before, but no, tonight it's barking and I can't sleep. Now I'd never met these neighbours before, but I was about to. <laughs> and I didn't care what I looked like. I left the house in my pyjamas, walked down the cul-de-sac around the street, walked up and knocked on the door. This young fellow answered the door. He said, hi. I said, hi, I'm Julie from over the back. I'm really sorry we've got to meet under these circumstances. It'd be really nice to meet you some other time. I'm a really nice neighbour. Really, I am. I love my neighbours. Sorry, as I said, that we had to meet like this. I know you've got a dog. I actually really like dogs too. I've got a dog. And I can sure hear your dog out there. I'm wondering if you can hear your dog. Do you know you've got a dog out there? Because your dog's barking a lot tonight. Normally, I wouldn't worry about it. But you know what? My husband's in hospital and he's had a stroke. And I don't know when he's coming home. So I'm really just trying to you know, do Christmas for tomorrow. And what I've got to do is get some sleep because I might have a breakdown if I don't. In fact, I may be having the breakdown right now on your doorstep. <laughs> so he listened to what I had to say. Ooh. And he kind of moved into the house a little bit more and he said, well, we gave away one of the dogs today. And I said, well, I was a wrong damn dog. <laughs> now, what I discovered is that anger's a step up from devastation. Maybe I'm on my way back. You know, and he took it like a good neighbour should because I took it all out on him. You know, but, but because I invited him to understand by letting him know my pain, he took it like a good neighbour should. He didn't try and say I was being unfair. He just shut up his dog and that was really helpful, I found. And so I went back and somehow we got through Christmas. And in those next few weeks, what I discovered was that I actually just couldn't get through a day. But what I discovered was you didn't have to get through a day. All I had to do was get through the moment I'm in. And whatever, and you've got to go back to trusting yourself because you have still got life itself, whatever you're faced with. You are still the miracle that was born into this world that had all of this opportunity and you still have life itself when it all falls apart out, of there, out there. And that is a gift. And so I learned that I could just live my life in moments. And if at this moment there was devastation and then I had anger, that was a step up because I felt a little more empowered. And then I had gratitude that he was still alive. Let me focus on that. There's a better feeling moment. And so we do that and then there was hope. He was showing progress. And then my girlfriends bought some sparkle up in a bottle. <laughs> that was helpful. <laughs> And there we have an afternoon therapy sessions of girlfriends sitting around sharing and crying. You have to invite people into your vulnerability so people can help. We did it as children so naturally, but because we can become consumed with keeping it all looking so perfect out there, we go, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. And sometimes we're not. And so my girlfriends come up and they allowed me to cry and share with me. And so... We continue on and we make progress. <clears throat> the boys go back to school in February. My youngest is four at the time. He had a speech delay, which we knew about, and he was getting speech therapy, but it wasn't about him anymore. My husband was now in therapy. And so Thomas goes to school and they say, Julie, you need to have Thomas assessed. If you've ever had a child assessed, you'll know that they look at everything they can't do and nothing that they can do. And the assessment comes back that Thomas lives with autism. So my house now looks like that current affair show that I know you've all seen with a child running around, head bunning walls, kicking in windows. I'm back to devastation saying, what the hell has happened to my life? But I have been here before. 
and I know that one moment of a to at a time I can come back again. Because do I delay happiness until somebody tells me when my husband will be back to the man I married? There is no date on a calendar for that. They don't know with a stroke. So best I find some happiness in amongst this situation or I'm going to have a miserable life. And my life doesn't deserve that and nor does yours because I still have the gift of a life. Best I find some happiness in amongst his autism because I'll give you the tip, they don't grow out of it. <laughs> or I'm going to have a miserable life and my children deserve more than that from me. And then I have this child running around, swearing, headbutting walls, kicking in windows, making all this noise. And what am I worried about? Because I can hear the neighbours slamming their windows and making judgments. So we've got two choices in this situation. There was one day I walked out into the backyard and said, if you think you can do it better, you're welcome. I could use a break. I didn't get any offers. But instead, I took the higher ground and I put a letter in all of the neighbours' letterboxes and said, I know you hear what's going on over here. I know I am difficult to live beside. I wouldn't want to live beside me. But you should try living with me. <laughs> and I would really appreciate your kindness and your, your, your support in this time that is really difficult. We are dealing with grief and autism. And what do you think happened after that? an outpouring of love and support. You have got to share your vulnerabilities so that people know how they need to help and know what's going on. That is not being weak. So I heard somebody say he's got too much pride to ask for help. It's because you have pride in yourself that you ask for help because you are worth that and we want to help each other. You've heard up here all of these messages about the value to all of us of being service to each other, but we can only do it when you let us know and invite us in with your vulnerability of telling us what's going on. So we fast forward for the next four years, caring for my husband, and Paul's speech this morning really touched a chord with me because I do know what it's like to be on the other side too, caring for somebody. He showed great progress and was doing, doing, growing great guns, but he did get an infection and he had to go into hospital to treat the infection with antibiotics. I spoke to him on the evening of the 10th of the 11th in 2009 and I said, I look forward to picking you up in the morning. It's funny how the 11th of the 11th was significant for Paul in a positive way. Well, on the 11th of the 11th, he never came home. He died before I picked him up that morning. <laughs> So I go back to devastation, but I have been here before and I know that one moment at a time I can come back again because I still have the gift of life and we can, as long as we have life itself of how we come back into this world, we've got something to build on and I owe my life to live the best life I can. So I do my sadness, don't be afraid of sadness. I went to a doctor with a pinched nerve in my neck after my husband had been diagnosed and my son, uh, my husband had a stroke, my son had been diagnosed and he said, why you got a pinched nerve? I said, I'm stressed. I know I went to bed stressed last night and I'm tense and I've got a pinched nerve. I just need some anti-inflammatories. And I started to cry. Wouldn't you think that would be appropriate considering my situation? He got out his little book and said, would you like something for it? He meant the crying. I said, how about a tissue? <laughs> because why isn't it okay to cry? You don't apologise for laughing and yet we're conditioned to apologise for crying. When you were sad, you'd be sad, but you noticed I wasn't sad here when you walked in. I didn't say, hi, Julie, I didn't say hi. Then you said, how are you? I said, crap. I've had stuff going on. Sit down, I'll tell you about it, which I managed to do. <laughs> so there, but because when you do your sadness, you're able to do your joy. So for the, the depths of my sadness, I have the heights of my joy. And so five years on since Flash passed away, I can tell you my boys have a resilience and a wisdom that are gifts that I know they would never have had had they not gone through this experience. Because even though we're born with all that within us, we need to work those emotional muscles for them to get strong. That's why you should not save your children from everything. So, and I wouldn't have wished this for them, but I know that if Jack, my oldest, goes into the world and loses something, outside, he's going to be okay because he knows how precious life itself is and that that's enough and he's got respect for that. And so me, I'm doing okay. I, you know, I still get sad. I feel vulnerable. I feel overwhelmed. And I have played that what if game many times. More recently, the other night, grief is quieter these days, but autism is loud as ever. And the other night I did go to bed and I said, what if, Julie, what if my husband didn't die? 
What if he never had the stroke? Because, you know, in that four years of him being cared, I felt like it sucked the life of our, out of our relationships. We're trying to keep autism to talk to stroke, stroke talk to autism, not lose my mind, not lose my other son, try and keep it all together, and you take him anyway. But it is what it is. And this is living a life. But what if he still was here? What if I didn't go through all that? What if I still had him and he could help me pay the bills and we could dream together? And life whispered to me, but Julie, what if you could have a look back at that? And what if you discovered it didn't turn out the way that you'd thought? What if you discovered you were not the person you are today and you didn't like what you saw? So we will never know the gifts that have been given to us because we can never go back and see the other, but we just have to accept where we've been and know that change is inevitable and that you were born into this world a miracle and you have enough in you to cope with this. Give life the respect it deserves because just because you have life, it is enough for whatever challenges we have out there. And we can do this. And the best part of this whole story is that because we're here, it's not the end yet. And isn't that exciting? So thank you very much. Thank you for having me.